A young man faces cancer. This isn't gonna be good. For a second time. Everywhere and growing. The diagnosis. He will die immediately. And the unlikely cure. I'm gonna go for it even if it kills me. On today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, good morning and welcome to the show. Melanoma, it's the least common, but the most deadliest form of skin cancer. And for 2017, it's estimated that there will be 87,000 new cases of melanoma in the United States with over 9,000 deaths from this disease. Startling statistics. Jordan Lawhead was just 17 years old when he first beat melanoma. He was 23 when the cancer returned and at first, was given six months to live. But soon after that, doctors declared that he would die within a few days. You hear the knock at the door, you hear the, the doctor kind of coming in, sitting down, and you can tell just by the look on his face that this isn't gonna be good. It had been six years since Jordan Lawhead had surgery to remove the malignant melanoma on his neck. Now 23, he learned the cancer had returned. This time it was stage four and had spread to his brain and beyond. It was in my head, it was in my neck, it was in my stomach, my back, my lungs, everywhere and growing. Even with treatment, doctors at Vanderbilt University Medical Center gave Jordan only six months to live. What you feel in that time is your heart is racing and your, your mind is racing you feel broken, completely broken, and devastated, and just reaching for whoever you can, and whoever you can, you're reaching for is broken too. Why him, Lord? Why, why not? Why not me? I would rather take take his place and and deal with all the suffering and the pain and agony and and all of that, rather than have him go through it. Doctors immediately started radiation to shrink the tumor in Jordan's brain. They also performed two emergency surgeries to remove part of his bowel and his appendix. Then Jordan's life expectancy dropped to just a few days when doctors discovered a fast-growing tumor on his neck. It was uh, threatening to pressure on his windpipe, you know, on trachea, which of course he would not be able to breathe and he would die immediately. Doctors felt Jordan's only hope was interleukin-2, the FDA considers it a black box drug, one that when used could be fatal. So we really were pushed into doing the risky treatment under even riskier circumstances. We had probably two days left to do it or not to do it at all. And it was in that moment I had to decide to believe that God has made us as individuals and not statistics. Jordan and his parents had been fervently praying for his recovery, and as word spread, Jordan heard from people all over the world. I had so many people praying for me. I was very fortunate to, to, uh, to hear from them. I had old people praying for me. I had kids praying for me. I had just strangers writing me, telling me, texting me that they were praying, asking God to intervene. I prayed for hours and I prayed the Lord would have mercy and everything that we had, all every ounce of our faith was relying that this boy would be rescued. The tumors began to shrink after the first treatment, taking Jordan out of immediate danger. It was slightly surprising to me. It was surprising to my family and it was surprising to the doctors. And when everybody's surprised and uh, feeling positive and excited, slightly holding their breath, we are just were all like, let's keep going, let's keep fighting. Give me another dose of that horrible stuff because it's working and I've, I'm gonna go for it even if it kills me. Over the next several months, Jordan endured three more rounds of interleukin. Then 18 months after Jordan was diagnosed, he was once again waiting for the doctor's knock on the door. 
and they said these very interesting words. Jordan has had a confirmed, complete response. The heartbreak that we talked about, the pain, the physical pain, was redeemed. It was a confirmed, complete response to the drug, <laughs> to the power of God intervening by all the people praying. It's been eight years since Jordan was given six months to live. With only 2% recovery rate for these cases, Dr. Puzinov says Jordan beat the odds. He is now 31 year old man with no cancer visible in brain or in body. Today, Jordan is a songwriter and musician and runs youinspire.org, a website to encourage others who face similar trials. But most of all, he is grateful to a God of mercy who can be trusted. I believe it taught me to see him as he is and as I am, and that I need to be joyfully dependent on his mercy at all times, that I'm not in control, that he is, and that when I put my trust in him with every part of my life, whether it's my health, my joy and career and plans and money and all of that, that I can be joyfully dependent on him because he is merciful and I have the scars to prove it. You are almost home. I need to be joyfully dependent upon him at all times. I guess that's the goal for all of us, isn't it? I'm not sure it's something we quickly get to unless we're put in circumstances where we have to be joyfully dependent on him in spite of the circumstances. What do you do when all the odds are against you, when everything that you're looking at with your human eyes and everything that others are speaking to you says there's no hope? You know, I just think of the scripture that we, we all speak so frequently and so freely. Whose report will you believe? You know, you don't really know until you're put in the place that Jordan was put at, where he says, no matter what, I'm going to fight, I'm going to do my part. And you know, if he hadn't had the miracle, God wouldn't have loved him any less. This is what God says. My ways are different than your ways. My thoughts are different than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. We cannot totally understand all of what happens in our lives. But we can stand on the word. We can do our part. That's what Jordan did. He went for it. He believed God. And God was there in that moment where he had days, two days maybe. And he said, I'm going to go for life. Whatever you're facing today, you choose life too. God is for you. He's not against you. He is the Lord, your healer. He is the God who sees you, who knows the number of hairs on your head. He understands his ways are different than ours, but his heart is always, always for us. If you need to pray with someone today about a specific need in your life, our phone lines are always available. Numbers toll free. It doesn't cost you anything to call. 1-800-700-7000. There's a friend on the other end of that line who'd love to pray with you today. We have some specific prayer requests we that do. have come we in. We have some prayer. We want to pray for you. And we have some prayer requests that have come in on our Facebook page. Debbie writes in, please pray for my husband, Mike. He has cancer and is receiving treatment. We want him to be 100% cancer free and for it to never come back. And then this in from Anna. Pray for a total healing miracle for Jude from paralysis. We are claiming that he will walk again. And then Margaret writes in, please pray for my grandnephew. He was just diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. We are so worried about him. Join with us in prayer. Let's create a great circle of prayer. And let's look for that full, that complete response that, that, that God wants to. Don't ever doubt the will of God in this. Just look to heaven. Is there anybody sick there? Anybody with cancer? And the answer is no. Well, that's God's will. And we're to pray that God's will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. 
join with us. Lord, we just lift these needs to you. We lift all those who have cancer, all those who are suffering with debilitating Ill illnesses, for those with paralysis, those with diagnosis that the doctor says there's nothing we can do for you. While we look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, we look to you, the creator of all things. And we ask that you would do creative miracles now. Where nerve connections have been severed, we ask that they be restored and they regrow again. For those where the doctors say there is no hope, come and give them hope. Be the God of all comfort to them. And for all those suffering with cancer, we come against it now in Jesus' name. And we say cancer cells divide and reproduce no more. Stop. Leave their bodies now. And let everything be whole and complete in Jesus. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Terry, God's given you something. I just believe there are many of you who have been given diagnoses that have really thrown you off base. Today, receive the word of the Lord. He is the Lord, your healer. Your hope is in him. His healing is complete for you. Just receive it now in Jesus' name. Lord, we receive you. We receive you. We ask that you come and be in us and that your will would be done in us as it is in heaven. Do it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer, we're here for you. It's our honor, our privilege to pray with you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, coming up, a wife gets a surprise phone call and learns that her husband is arrested for sexually abusing her daughter. You don't want to miss her story. It's next after this. Wendy Roche thought she was married to Mr. Wonderful. Instead, he turned out to be her worst nightmare. Take a look. The nightmare started when Wendy Roche got a phone call from the police. In a horrifying moment, she learned her husband, who was in law enforcement, had been arrested. He had been sexually abusing her daughter for the past six years. Devastated at the news, she cried out to God for help as she faced humiliation, homelessness, and even unemployment. In her book, Unbroken, Wendy shares her story of starting over and offers words of hope and comfort for those who are suffering. Well, joining us now is Wendy Roche. Wendy, it's great to have you with us. Mm -hmm. You know, as I read your book, I thought it's just hard to imagine what it must have been like to get that phone call so out of the blue and you were so unsuspecting, but it did change your life. Completely. My life was stripped away. I had the agony of what my children had gone through and the yeah. choices that I made that didn't turn out the way I had expected. But honestly, you thought that your husband was just this stellar stand-up guy. He was in law enforcement. This was your daughter from another marriage. Uh, you know, I don't, you say in the book it never occurred to you, and yet you did have a feeling in you that something was not right. And you often hear people who've gone through these kinds of things say that. What were you experiencing? I was experiencing a lot of confusion and just an unsettledness that was in my heart that I couldn't make sense of. Yeah. And I was going for, you know, I was offered a promotion. And at the time, my husband had said, oh, don't do it. It could just stress you out. And he actually lined up a counseling appointment for me to go to a counselor. And the counselor and I talked and talked many sessions, could not figure out what this unsettledness was. I know now what it was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I learned from that, that if there's an unsettledness in me, I'm a new person now because I realize I have the Lord in my life now that I chose yes. to invite into my life. And if I get an unsettledness now, Listen. I'm on my yeah. knees. Lord, mm -hmm. 
Give me the eyes to see what I need to see. Give me the ears to hear what I need to hear. If there's danger, show me, help me, use me. You actually found this out because your daughter was visiting with her biological dad and had been told by the, your current husband that if not your current now, but your current dad, <laughs> that if, if she ever told you, you would not be able emotionally to handle it and would take your life. So this is how the whole thing came out. What was so astonishing as I read your book was the ramifications once this became known to you and your children. It was really unbelievable. I mean, you, you had media on your door, peeking in your windows. People at work now know, the kids know, it's on the front page of the newspaper. How did you contend with all of that? You know, it was so difficult. I can't It imagine. was so humiliating. Yeah. And, but you know what? There's a shame that goes with this, unfortunately, and it's an unmerited shame on the victim. Yeah. And although we weren't the ones who had made that choice to act and do inappropriate mm -hmm. and illegal things, we felt like we were the ones in prison. Yeah. Yes. And unfortunately, those who go through trauma many times are the ones who feel they're imprisoned with, with the media and all the things. As a matter of fact, I didn't watch TV for five years after that because of the impact it had. Mm -hmm. And now to be here on TV and saying God saves, and He can redeem, and He can make you new. <laughs> there's not just a shame attached to it. There's a blame attached to it, too. You blamed yourself for what your daughter had experienced. How did you get to the place where you could forgive yourself? You know, a lot of time with the Lord. I love that He says in Jeremiah 29, 13, when you seek me, you will find yeah. me. When you seek me with all your heart. And I just would, I would spend so much time with the Lord just in prayer and crying out my heart to Him and letting Him know, help. I need help. I need you to help me through this. And He showed me, you know, there was a moment when He said to my heart, Wendy, had you known what the outcome would have been, would you have made the choice to marry Him? And the answer is no. Yeah. Had I known how it would end, I would never yeah. have gone that route. Of course not. And so the Lord just slowly showed me to forgive myself. And then He also showed me that there's nothing He's been, that I've been through that He hasn't been through Himself. And He totally has the compassion mm -hmm. and understanding for what I'm going through. And knowing that His love was there to just pick me up and carry us through mm -hmm. miracle after miracle, how He carried us through our life and re-established and rebuilt our life in miraculous ways. This happened many years ago. The book is coming out now. How is your daughter today? You know what? She is a courageous, brave, wonderful woman. She has such a compassion of justice mm -hmm. for the underdog. She wants to make sure that people are respected and cared for. And she has been a wonderful example to, to me, yeah. but also in this thrive that I've had since the book came out, I've had this deep desire to want to do more for those that are in my daughter's shoes and those in this situation. It's, an, it's astonishing and it's, it's a scary number. But one in How three, many people are one there? One in three mm -hmm. women and one in four men are sexually wow. abused in their life. But here's even hor more horrible than that. Before age 18, one in four girls and one in six boys are sexually abused. That's a huge number. Yeah, if you think of how many children number. you know, you could just number out how many are vulnerable to this. Mm -hmm. They say there's about 42 million victims of child abuse and sexual abuse walking around just in our nation today. And the sad part of that is without healing, it will truly impact their lives. What do you want people who read Unbroken to come away with? You know, I want them to come away with the hope that I found, and that's why I wrote it. I didn't write it to tell a horrible story. I told it to show the contrast of what God can do with your life if you choose to allow Him in. Mm -hmm. He says, I stand at the door and knock, but it's our choice to open that door and let Him in. And when I did, He rebuilt my life into something beautiful. And I want to give that hope to every reader. I've had people who've read it who said it was hard to read the hard stuff, 
but I'm so glad I finished it because I'm talking to God. I'm trusting in God. Mm -hmm. My life is changing. It's a process (laughs) for all of us, and that's why they call him the Redeemer. He takes what's been lost, and he makes something good out of it. You know, the book is called Unbroken. If you want to learn more about Wendy's story, the subtitle is A True Story of Hope in Starting Over. And who doesn't want to hear that message? It's available wherever books are sold. Wendy, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Gordon? Well, still ahead, the children at school mocked her and told her she was in a cult. How did she respond? Well, she boldly invited them to church. See how a cartoon won them over when we come back. Christianity is on the rise in China, and people like Tian Tian are a big reason why. She's boldly telling other children about the gospel, thanks to a little help from Superbook. Tian Tian is a Christian at a school in China where most students are atheists and Muslims. We are taught that there really is no God, but that has never stopped me from believing in the God of the universe and how He forgave our sins by His own blood. She desperately wants her classmates to know God too. I want my classmates to be blessed and saved, like I am. But sometimes when I share, they tell me I'm in a cult and that I am lying. One time a boy mocked my faith and I cried. For a month, Tian Tian stopped going to church and was afraid to share the gospel. Then she had a talk with her dad and remembered an episode of Superbook she'd seen that was translated into Mandarin for the children of China. Superbook taught me lots of principles about life and that made me want to do things God's way and please Him. Plus, I found out that Chris and Joy are just like me. Tian Tian learned that she had to love her enemies, so she started praying for the students who'd hurt her feelings. And when she found out there was going to be a Superbook party at church, she invited her classmates. They all came and found it very interesting. After Superbook was shown, Tian Tian's Sunday school teacher asked if there was anyone who wanted to know more about Jesus. And some of Tian Tian's classmates stood up. I had never been to church before, so this was the first time I heard about Jesus. I learned about how Jesus could change my life. Now I want to watch more Superbook. Having my classmates meet Jesus is like saving their lives. It makes me so happy. Superbook is fantastic. My wish is that more and more children in China will watch it and know the Lord Jesus, and that everyone around the world will accept God. That is a wonderful prayer, and let's have everyone accept God. We want to get the stories of the Bible to the children of the world, and we're using Superbook to do that. We're on our way to 50 languages. Once we hit 50 languages, we want to take it all the way to 500 languages. So children have the opportunity around the world to know the stories of the Bible uh, and to meet Jesus. And then each episode uh, concludes with what we call the Salvation Poem. It's a song where you sing a song of salvation to Jesus and you ask Him to come into your heart. It's wonderful what happens when children get that message and understand it. And then the incredible thing that we didn't anticipate when we were creating it is that once they get it, they want to share it. And they want to share it with their family, their friends, and they're becoming evangelists. And it's absolutely incredible. It's all made possible because people like you care enough to give to say yes. Together, we can take the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. So if that's you and you want to participate, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, and say, I want to give to Superbook. We've got a Superbook DVD club for you. Uh, There's a way you can get the episodes. We also have a free Superbook app. It's all made possible because people care enough to give. So if that's you, call us now, one 800 Seven hundred seven thousand. Here's a word for you from Romans. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. We'll see you again.